So uh, welcome, welcome to all our viewers. Um, welcome to our panelists, beautiful filmmakers from across South Africa and some from out of uh, South Africa. Welcome to the um, viewers from anywhere around the world. And welcome to this session. This is a DFA doc share in um, within the Encounters Festival, and we are in the distribution panel discussion. And I just want to first just introduce uh, basically all the filmmakers, but we won't um, speak about their bios now because they are seriously super blames. Um, and okay, just to introduce myself, my name is Sibu Kiba. Just for everyone who doesn't know who I am, I am one of the DFA members. Uh, I'm in the board as well of the DFA, which is quite exciting. I'm from the Eastern Cape, so I am sitting in East London right now and beautiful province, but uh, more relaxed than Cape Town and Gauteng and Durban, but um, we're getting there within the film industry. Um, and I'm the co-founder of Sivabusha Media, which is a multimedia and documentary production company based here in East London. So I'm also a filmmaker, like everyone else. I'm here to learn as well, gain um, exciting here about all the exciting stories that all the filmmakers have to share. And today with us, we have our incredible, incredible filmmakers, um, Jody Sang, who's the director of a film called I here, as well as producer Gabriela Bloomberg, who's also a producer in, I'm, in the film I'm Here. We also have in our panels, we have um, a film called The Colonel's Stray Dogs and the director slash film, I mean, uh, director slash producer Khalid Shamis is also amongst us today, as well as producers Stephen Markovitz, as well as Tamsin Ranger. And um, last but not least within our panels, we have um, a film called I, Mary, and the direct director is Aliki Saragas. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that very well. If um, she'll help me when she comes along, when she speaks. And also producer Bridget Pickering. Um, I just want to welcome, give you a warm, warm welcome to the panelists today. We're going to have um, a beautiful discussion. I just want us to make this very relaxed and, you know, it's all about um, conversations. You know, it's not like a formal, um, try to make it strict or formal, um, please chip in and let's make it interactive as best as possible and make it exciting. It's a Friday. Hope everybody has their coffee and I don't know, anything else to drink is all good in the session. It's 11 o'clock, so yeah, anything goes. Um, I just wanna introduce what DocShare Initiative is all about. Um, this is an initiative from the Documentary Filmmakers Association of South Africa. And DocShare really is all about creating opportunities, um, especially from experienced filmmakers, um, film professionals. They um, should share their knowledge um, and engage with you know, anything that is relevant within the film industry, um, from issues to excitement to any, um, you know, ways of how you can be a lead documentary filmmaker. Um, we have our members on board also joining us to listen in, um, in the conversations. So the big aim of why we're doing this is to be able to create and share knowledge and experiences that are coming from experienced filmmakers who have won awards, who have had their films um, screened in different platforms around the world. Um, we'd like to share with those aspiring and upcoming filmmakers who really want to understand how to break into the industry being documentary filmmakers, as we know that that um, this type of uh, genre of filmmaking is very different from your features um, and also maybe your short stories as well. So it's, it's a very interesting genre and that's 
the reason why we are creating these particular platforms so that people can learn how to create their content and put it out there for everyone to see. So it's all about engagement and I look forward to hearing from everyone who is going to be um, giving us the, the um, information about their faults. So let's, without wasting any time, let us go straight into it. And our very first film that we are going to engage with is a film called I'm Here. And um, I mean, it's, it's very, when I was watching the film, very, very interesting, heartbreaking as well, but um, very inspiring, you know, where you're coming, where you have a, 90, a 98 year old woman who is just expressing her experiences. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful film that offers a portrait of a 90 year old Polish Holocaust survivor, Ella, she's got a very interesting personality, whose vibrance and vitality has been deemed by either age, um, has not been deemed by her, her age, her weight, even though her experiences has been rather terrible, um, but she's very, very exciting. So we're gonna chat today to Jody Sank, who's the director, as well as the producer, beautiful Gabriella Brimberg. And I think um, what I'd like to do is for them to actually introduce themselves. I think um, it's better when one expresses what they're all about, the accolades and how um, these amazing um, film, exciting experiences that they've gained making the film I'm Here. So I know that probably Gabriella will start. Um, so take it right away. Hello, hello, thanks for having us. Um, and I'm actually going to let Geordie start this one. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, yeah, so just wanting to say a big thank you to the DFA, to Encounters. Um, I must say, um, Gabriella and I are, are pretty new actually to, you know, this is our first feature documentary. We've been working on the documentary for two years now. And, um, you know, sort of, we sort of, I guess the lightweights on this panel um, and you know just to be on the, the panel with such incredible documentary directors and producers um, we're really just so honored to uh, to share on this panel with you um, so just if I could share my screen um, and I will show you Gabrielle and I will take you through a, a brief presentation I think Sibu um, summed up the film um, extremely well um, you know it's a holocaust survivor story but we really, really just wanted to focus mainly on the present day life of this, of this extraordinary 98 year, year old woman who just lives with such a zest for life and vitality that we've really never seen in, in someone before. And despite what she's been through, she's sort of teaching us all lessons on how to live life with positivity and just uh, um, incredible energy. Um, so yeah, that's just a little brief summary of the film. Sure. So in line with what this talk is about in terms of our goals and our strategy, as Geordie mentioned, this was both of our first um, feature films. We both had independently made um, short films. Um, and what we really found useful was before we even started looking at distributors um, or sales agents, we really looked inwards and we, we looked at um, we did a technique called SWOT, Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities and Threats, um, which I'm sure everyone's heard of. And we really found it quite useful. Um, this was, we, we did it internally looking at ourselves as a team and we also looked at the film. And some of the things that came out of it for us was we realized, you know, some, some of the weaknesses were um, that it's very, it's difficult when we, to, to make a film about the Holocaust. Um, because when you're pitching a film, it sounds like a, you know, kind of dry historical documentary and there are many um, testimonies of Holocaust survivors. Um, and obviously with COVID-19 being a threat, but we really honed in on what our strengths were. We, we knew that the story was different to a typical Holocaust documentary um, in terms of Ella's personality. Um, she really is just phenomenal. Um, and feisty and sassy and and you get to meet that through meet her through the film um and obviously the the story about discrimination 
could not be more relevant um, in a world that we live in today. Um, you know, where everyone is defining themselves by what is other. So to really, to, to show the dangers um, and the extent that discrimination can go to, we knew we, that the story needed to be shared now. Um, and obviously we, we looked at what our opportunities were. There's a very, um, you know, we, we had the backing of the South African film community. Um, we knew that there were lots of, um, we could draw on the Holocaust centers or Jewish film festivals or, you know, places that would be particularly interested in this. Um, so we did this, this process for our team and for the film, which was interesting. What was, was also important for us before we even started looking um, at sales agents was thinking about the balance between what do we actually want to get out of this film in terms of do we want to recoup costs, do we want to establish ourselves as filmmakers, um, or do we want this film to be educational? Um, and of course you can get all three, but it's you can't necessarily make you, you can't get them all at, at in, you know, priority one. Um, so for us on a personal level, we really wanted this film to make an impact, to have an educational life. We also, as Geordie said, this is our first feature film. So we wanted to establish ourselves as filmmakers. Um, and of course we wanted to recoup the costs. Um, our strategy has been quite um, linear and quite typical in terms of that we wanted to go to film festivals first. We made you know, spreadsheets of um, Jewish film festivals, human rights film festivals, of course, South African film festivals and A-list film festivals. And we, you know, looked at, we had a quite a strategy of looking at the dates and which ones were our priorities. Um, and of course, then when we spoke to sales agents, we, we, we looked at their strategy in terms of the theatrical release and broadcast. And of course, one of our biggest priorities has been um, we really want this film to have an educational life in schools, in centers, in museums, and that will be, you know, when, once we've completed the first two steps. Um, then, just in terms of getting your project out there, um, we actually received incredible adv advice from, from one of the other panelists here. We actually spoke to, uh, to Tamsin um, about two years ago. And one of the, the most incredible things that she said to us was attend as many of the local festivals um, as you possibly can. And you know, th th that'll help you understand the industry, it'll help you network. And that's what we did. We, we went to uh, the Durban International Film Festival in 2019. Uh, we sent out about probably a hundred emails of different people trying to set up meetings with all international uh, people there. And um, we probably got about 10 to 15 replies and we set up about 10 to 15 meetings, which was, was great from having no meetings to at least having 15. And, I must say that those 15 people that we spoke to really helped shape the film because we were still busy editing. And also not only that, it also helped us understand what, what different people in the film industry are looking at and what distributors are actually, and the festivals are actually wanting from the film. So uh, that was incredible advice. Um, and I, I just think also in, in, in COVID right now, one thing that Gabby, Gabby and I realized as well is um, we had uh, an opportunity because of all the festivals going online um, you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily fly to, uh, to Cannes or, or, or somewhere international because of the massive costs of accommodation and flights. But there were certain festivals that we were actually able to attend and to network and to, um, to listen to talks from um, because it was all online. So that was just a really, a, actually a positive of, uh, of what we saw happening with COVID. Um, and what we did is we actually just reached out to a lot of filmmakers um, at encounters last year, um, at the virtual encounters, we listened to so many talks. And, um, you know, when a talk really spoke to us, we reached out to those documentary filmmakers and, you know, we asked for meetings and a lot of them were, were really incredible with getting advice for us on impact strategy, on, on uh, you know, sort of the next sort of steps for our film. Um, so, and yeah, and we just sort of kept a spreadsheet of, you know, the hundreds of contacts that we had made through the different festivals uh, the different meetups and um, and distributors and sales agents that we were able to um, to be in touch with, and um, we also sort of just really found ways of of you know when you're sending a cold email to someone, um, you know you've got to be really really careful not to bore them with you know having so many texts. So we really we found innovative ways of you know putting a teaser or putting a gif or putting a um, you know a really really enticing picture that got them to sort of take the meeting with us and to really, really want to um, meet, to meet with us. Um, 
And then one more thing I'll, I'll just add is um, when we signed on to the Marche du Film with Cannes, we got access to an application called Sanando, um, which I really think everyone should look, should look into. Um, basically, Sanando is a platform that connects filmmakers, distributors, sales agents. And, you know, we really were able on that application to see which distributors and sales agents were interested in different types of films and what films they had on their slate. And, you know, all of their contact information is actually on that site. So uh, that was really vital in us reaching out to the sales agent that we eventually went with uh, in the end. Yeah, I think, um, as Jordi's mentioning, we, you know, we came in to the projects um, without any experience in sales and distribution. Like when we started this project, we thought we're going to film Ella, we're going to film her testimony, we'll be done like two months later. <laughs> like we, we didn't, you know, um, we didn't realize the journey that this film needed to go on. And I think what was, as we, as we realized how important um, it was to tell her story in a new way and as the project developed, we obviously had to build had to build our team and we were kind of thrown into the deep end. But what we were just so amazed with was how many people came on board, either for really reduced rates um, or free of charge because they believed in the film's message. Um, you know, whether that was publicists or, um, you know, we even, we, we attended like some masterclasses say, that the Sundance Academy had done. So, you know, things like this that were free that were being streamed on YouTube or Facebook. And we reached out to people from there. Um, and even just people giving, sharing their advice or giving contacts um, was just really useful for us. And I think it was, um, you know, if, if you, if you like, I just kind of think if we had watched a talk like this two years ago, um, we were in a space where we really didn't know what to do. Um, and to know that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just ask for advice and people are willing to give it. Um, I think one of those things that were really useful was speaking to um, producers and directors, um, also who had you know, first time um, feature filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, asking them what their process was, what they did right, what they did wrong, we're looking for distributors. Um, and it was also really, um, we kind of honed in on our, the key, um, you know, points where, where we would need advice. And if we didn't get a response from somebody first, we obviously we weren't going to spam people, but we um, sent another email to, to check in. And I think, um, you know, we keep mentioning our spreadsheets, but it was really useful to, to update our, um, our spreadsheets as we went along. And it just um, also kind of holds you in good stead for the next film, because then you've got you know, your list of um, which, you know, which films are, were similar to yours, you've got a list of distributors, you've got a list you, um, of film festivals and their timelines. So it really just was useful to be organized. Right, and um, so, yeah, so I think, um, I know we're running a bit short on time, so I'm gonna, um, I'm not gonna repeat some of the points, um, but, yeah, we spoke to many filmmakers who had similar films in, in sort of the same genre as us and with similar themes and, um, you know, and who they sold to, why they sold to them. And I think just a bit of a word of caution, I think you, you need to do um, sort of your due diligence of, of your sales agents that you're going to be going with because um, there were a few that we were in contact with and, and things that seemed really, really fantastic. But then when, we, then when we spoke to other documentary filmmakers, about the experience with that sales agent. Um, you know, th th we got a lot of comments that, you know, they had too many films on their slate and that they didn't have any sort of time for them and they weren't getting back to them. And, you know, so, so I think it's just really, really uh, useful to, to, you know, um, cast your net out to the documentary filmmaking community um, for, for um, why they went with a certain sales agent and what that experience was like. Um, and then, yeah, we also, we had a, a really long list of questions um, that we would ask our sales agent, um, just like, you know, to sort of tick all the boxes for us. And then I think really what, you, what you'll find is someone who's really passionate about the message of the story and who believes in the film, when it comes down to the nitty gritty of discussing the finances and legalities, you'll see that they, they're a lot more open and, you know, they want you to be happy as well. Um, that's what we found with the sales agent that we went with. We went with Metro International 
entertainment that's based in the UK and they were just absolutely incredible to us. They really just opened up everything for us um, because they love the film and, and Ella's message. Sure, I think just to, to sum up, there's, you know, we, as I mentioned, when we came into this, we had this big misconception, I think, about the film industry that, um, that people aren't, um, aren't happy to share advice or, you know, you have to have a network as you go in and you have to know people and you have to have all these connections. And it really was just eye-opening to... Um, and I think quite humbling to say, we don't, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's ask people, let's ask for advice. And we just were, um, are so grateful for the people that took time, um, to invest in, you know, just give us, give us time and give us their advice. And, you know, we would love to do that for, um, for anyone who's watching this panel or who wants advice on their film, you can feel free to reach out feel free to reach out to us. Um, I think, yeah, just, I just keep thinking of us two years ago when we started this, this film and to be on, to be on this panel, um, it really is a privilege and thanks for having us. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, Jody and Gabri Gabriella. That was fantastic. Really, really beautiful to hear from you guys. Um, I'm not going to speak so much, but just they didn't mention a little bit about the fact that Jody's film, The Locket, was once nominated for SAFTAs. And also Gabriella has also, when she was a student, she was, um, she won best uh, short film, which was really, really quite brilliant. So um, really, really we clap hands. We've got um, one question that we can definitely go straight into. Um, and I'm just going to go straight into the questions now. Um, this is from Neely uh, Portugali. And he says that um, which are which other ways of distribution did you guys go through personally instead of uh, perhaps the recommending to talk to people, et cetera, et cetera. I think that also adds to did you guys have um, distribution in mind specifically when you started out the film, considering that you have slight bit of experience in what it means for distributing your films? Um, so I think for us, um, we really had no, no background in distribution, but what helped us is that, you know, when the film was still in the edit, we, we were looking for distributors because I think we just knew that, you know, it was almost like a foreign concept for us. We had like zero interactions of distribution. So for us from an early stage, still in the edit, uh, we were, were working on distribution and still trying to you know, come up with a marketing strategy of how to entice um, your, the distributors and what's going to sort of wet their palate so that they'd actually want to be involved in the film. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's really where we where we started um, on our distribution journey. Gab, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I think it was also for us just understanding um, what sales agents do. Understanding, obviously, it's difficult to speak to distributors as um, as a first time um, production company because they won't take unsolicited content. So realizing, um, you know, we then looked at different sales agents and tried to find the, the, a good fit for that. Um, so I think that it, it really was through looking at films that were similar to ours, going on their IMDb page, seeing who had, was a sales agent for them or who distributed them and making, making that list um, so that that was you know that was how we how how we kind of looked we found our options um and as jory said we started really early i mean we started speaking to distributors seven months before the film was finished um which also was actually quite useful for us because the the distributors that we went with had actually given advice on one of our cuts in order to um you know strengthen it commercially and we also saw how passionate they were about the project rather than going with somebody who maybe has a big name, but doesn't actually care about the, the subject matter. 
actually. Well, one thing also just to, to add on is I, I think also, depending on what the subject matter of your film is, lean on, um, like, you know, for us, we were very lucky because we dealt through with the South African Holocaust centers. And, you know, there was a wellspring of, of information that we got from them on, you know, putting us in touch with other filmmakers on just like, you know, distributors, et cetera, people that they know had distributed films like that, like that. So I think depending on the subject matter of your film, try and, and find organization centers that, you know, might have the connections and be able to sort of guide you in the, in the right direction. Absolutely, spot on. Um, really appreciate that. Um, we actually have a really cool comment from Mickey. Um, and she says, there's one last question. So the comment and then the last question, then we go to the next awesome filmmakers. So she says, um, I can really commend Jody and Gabriella. Um, for their strategic measured processes. I think that's also really brilliant. Um, I think new and established filmmakers can learn from your clear process and commitment, your recognition that people are there to help if you ask, and well done on a beautiful film and um, real commitment. So definitely heads up on that. Um, and that's from Mickey. So the very last question there is, is that um, it's actually for Gabriella. Um, as a young producer, because I know many producers um, will want to know this, you know, as a young producer, did you find working in the project um, that you found support from the industry, especially like having to also be involved in the distribution um, elements of film um, when exploring your options? So, um, yeah, that's the question. And also, how can industry support new filmmakers trying to break into the industry? It's a lovely question. Um, I think it, it firstly, we, I think we did find a lot of support. Um, and Mickey, thank you for your comment. And it's a perfect example of someone who gave us support. We, um, I suppose, midway through, we joined the, the DFA and um, we asked Mickey some advice and, and she really was just always open to answering our emails and giving us advice. I think the biggest um, learning curve, um, both, I, I actually study directing. So this was both of my, Geordie and I, um, you know, first time making the production decisions. Um, so I think that one of the, the biggest things that we found difficult was even looking for, um, you know, like templates for budget and post-production schedules and a lot of things that we had been involved in on a short film, but not on a feature. So I think what we found useful, and um, I think it also answers your second question about industry events, is having um, talks, sharing resources, um, all of those legal documents and financial documents that you need, it's a business. Um, and I think that was the biggest learning curve for us and, and, what, and what would be most useful to be shared. Oh, splendid. Um, well said. And thank you very much, Jody and Gabriella. It was lovely to hear from you. And now we move on to our next exciting film, which is The Colonel's Stray Dogs. Amazing. I'm just going to share screen just, um, just for a little bit. And then we can just go straight into who, where we are. So if any of the attendees have not watched this film, they definitely, definitely need to go and watch it. Um, and we have the courtesy of being joined by the director slash also producer, as we found out today, Khalid Shamis, and also producers Stephen Markovitz, as well as Tamsin Ranger. Um, I will also let them introduce themselves and share their accolades, because I know they are very big 
big um, in the industry, and we are very excited to have them on board. I won't speak a lot, but um, the film, The Colonel Stray Dogs, is an activism film, um, family orientated. It's actually quite a very personal story of Khalid's, um, and I think that's perhaps why he was also part um, producer slash director. Um, it's got a lot of suspense um, because some moments are very, very um, quite emotional as well. Um, it also talks a lot about displacements. So I'm just going to read the logline and then we invite um, the director Khalid to just briefly share with us his experiences. Um, and also Stephen and Tamsin can also speak a lot about um, distribution because I know they're also quite early into the um, distribution channels. So the lockline is a profile of a political activist, as well as a portrait of a father and a family worried for decades for his safety. The colonel Stray Dogs sees filmmaker Khalid Shamis return home to explore his father's role in the Libyan resistance to Colonel Gaddafi's brutal rule, both in Libya and from exile in London. So that's quite a very, very interesting. And I'd like to give over to Khalid, if you can share with us just a little bit of your experience and, you know, just share with us what it meant to kind of market the film out there, um, you know, share your personal story as well, um, as I know that it's a family oriented story. I will stop sharing screen. Hello everyone. Hi Sivu. Thank you for being seeing you again and for encountering for hosting us. And um, hello to our uh, other projects like really great films and filmmakers. Nice to be here with you. Um, I um, it's interesting you say that uh, all the film is seen as an activism film because it never was intended that way. But thinking about it, all the films that we make have some um, form of activism in them. Right, or, so it wasn't an intention in, in the film, but I guess my father is an activist and maybe what the story talks to in some of its themes um, have that kind of quality. So um, uh, thank you for, uh, for introducing it. I think we, we uh, maybe best to start if we start with Stephen and then talking about the overall strategy and we can get into the, into the personal of the film because you know, Stephen and Tamsin have lots more experience than I do with distribution and these kind of strategies. Um, so yeah, better to go from them first. Thank you. Thanks, Khaled. And yeah, thank you for inviting us to this panel. And, uh, and Sivu, I just wanted to ask you earlier, you said it's 11 o'clock, anything goes. And I want to know <laughs> what, how far we can go. But uh, I don't know if you meant it's time for an early weekend, but uh, I'm up for it. And also just to say for, for Jordi and Gabriella, that was a great presentation. And I think it's really good to hear all of that because I think there's a lot of lessons in that about being systematic and being uh, tenacious. Uh, and, um, and I think that's the kind of energy one should bring to, to the films that we make. Uh, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction and then um, Tamsin's going to talk about festivals, I'll talk about sales agents, and then Khalid will talk about something much deeper than all of that. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, when Khalid brought us this project, um, we, I was quite uh, 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 very happy that he brought it to us. I mean, he could have taken it to to lots of people. And uh, I think, you know, one thing I've learned is the longer I do this, the less I know. And it sounds just like a phrase, but it really is true is that I think that you can, you, when you look at a film, you've really got to ask yourself, why do I want to make this film? What is the like real intention behind it? And often one has surface intention and deeper intentions. And I think we've really got to question that a lot. And then you want, we all want to make films that are successful. And, uh, you know, what does success look for uh, us? Uh, it can mean different things, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Like, what are your real aims for the project? And what I mean by knowing less as I 
as I do this longer, is that you never know if a film is going to do well or not. It's like every time uh, I'm surprised at a film which I thought would be quite humble and it ended up having a really good life and vice versa. So I think all one's got is one's instinct. Uh, and also what's really important is who you work with, is that you, you believe that there's trust and respect and like something mutually beneficial in that relationship. I think is really important um, uh, because you're going to go down a long road together and it's going to be tested and uh, you really need to, to stick together. So, yeah, we, when we set out to, to uh, uh, work on this film, I think Khalid had already raised a bit of development money and uh, we went down a long road. I know Khalid's work like, started on this project 10 years ago and uh, I think we got involved probably about seven years ago. I'm not, yeah, something like that. So it's been a long road. And I think, you know, making these films, it's not always rational. It's certainly not uh, fun, often financially uh, very attractive, but uh, for me, it was an important film to work on. Uh, and, um, and I think that, uh, I think what Jordi and Gabriella were saying earlier is really important about this, you know, being tenacious and approaching lots of people uh, and doing uh, due diligence. So I'm not going to go much further. I, I think that that uh, I'm going to ask Khalid to just talk a bit about about what the film is about and and what it meant to him. And then we'll go on to Tamsin, and then I'll talk about sales agents, and we'll come back to Khalid at the end. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. I also want to applaud. Um... Jordi and Gabriella's presentation and their way of going into it. I, I certainly am not, uh, don't have those strategies. I have other, I'm tenacious in other ways, which I guess talks to perseverance, right? When you make, you make this film over a long time. So yeah, just briefly, I mean, the film is about, you know, it's been in the, uh, in the, in my life for all my life. And, um, it's about my father who was, who was exiled from Libya when Gaddafi came into power in 69. And then since then, uh, he's been living in London where he met my mother and we grew up. And since then, he always maintained this opposition to this government that came in. And um, uh, soon, after he was, soon after Gaddafi was in power, after a few years, my dad was on a blacklist. He couldn't go back. And then five years after that, by the early 80s, Gaddafi was sending out hit squads to kill um, and take out opponents abroad. And so my father was on that list and him and his, some of the, his colleagues um, in exile organized one of the major oppositions to uh, the Gaddafi's Libya in exile. Um, the, the main opposition, there were others, but that, that was the main opposition. And so I lived my life, my young life, with this, you know, my father dreaming of Libya, dreaming of going back, and at the same time, um, uh, organizing to take Gaddafi out with, you know, through various means, military means, um, and which went into journalism and uh, expose. And eventually it was, um, it was the people of Libya who, who got rid of Gaddafi and Gaddafi's Libya. Um, in 2011. And then a whole other story opens up about the void. So the, the film kind of looks at this uh, modern historic, his, the modern history of Libya, the political history, um, and this very personal private space of exile. And, um, you know, the son or myself you know, uh, questioning my father about the moves he made when we were youngsters and what Libya now, the dream of Libya now means to him now. Um, so it tries to balance that the, the personal and political. Um, and I wanted to say that, uh, yeah, when I started making the film by 2013, I um, realized I needed a producer. I was kind of going out there alone. I had raised a little bit of money and it was, I was still developing, but I needed to work um, with someone else. And Stephen and Big World Cinema had always been in mind because one of the main reasons was because of the film that was made with Jihan Atahri um, uh, behind the rainbow, 
which involved lots of archive. It was a political story. And I thought, I need, you know, I need uh, uh, an experienced produ producer to, um, to help me navigate archive. I realized there was a lot of archival material that was needed in the film and to navigate uh, the, uh, I guess the political world of film production, documentary film production. Also to help to have, you know, to have help where I could stand back and not get too bogged down in, in the administration of it all. Um, uh, and yeah, Stephen was always, uh, you know, first, to, it first came to mind. Um, and I've learned so much and I've learned so much from Tamsin who, who has also been a very strong driver as a co-producer in the film. Um, I'm not sure if I would produce a film on my own again, if I'd made one. I would definitely work with uh, people who we trust. And it's a long road, as Stephen says, it's a long road and you need to be in this relationship for, uh, for a while. And so uh, you need people who you can trust when the chips are down and uh, people who you can respect and learn from through the process. So yeah, thank you for that. Great, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Khalid. Tamsin, do you, you want to talk about festivals for a bit? Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks to the DFN Encounters for the panel and to all the fantastic panelists. Um, yeah, I thought I'd just touch on a few things, um, some of which Gabby uh, Gabriella has already sort of mentioned. I too love a spreadsheet. All about a spreadsheet, Khalid. We have a very strong Google Drive interaction going on there. Um, but yeah, I'll just touch on what sort of what our strategy is, which I'm sure is familiar to all the panelists and, and I'm sure a lot of the, the people watching, um, but hopefully something in there for everybody else. Um, yeah, basically with our festival strategy, I think what's always exciting is to aim big, um, you know, to aim high. So, you know, we, we We've been lucky to attend a lot of festivals, to have films at festivals, so we do have a good sense um, of sort of the festivals that are out there, what they're looking for, the kinds of films that they program. Uh, and I think there will be resources through the DFA as well to guide uh, filmmakers, um, to sort of give them guidance to the lay of the land in terms of the festival landscape. Um, but yeah, so we, we obviously thought about world premiere and then of course all the different regional premieres. What would be the sort of first prize for each region? So North America, Europe, uh, United Kingdom, Africa. Um, so you aim high, you do your submissions or maybe you know a programmer and you're able to communicate directly with them and send a link or you get uh, a link gets requested, all that, all that process. And of course, sometimes you don't get in. Um, as Khalid indicated, sometimes the chips feel down for a while. Um, and uh, you keep going. And we did obviously get some rejections to festivals that we perhaps hoped might take the film. Um, we were very lucky to have a, a you know, fantastic world premiere with Hot Docs in Toronto. Um, also, as, as Jordi and Gabriella touched on, you know, the COVID landscape has changed festivals, has changed distribution, and has changed the sort of um, the film consumption experience um, and the and the festival experience. So Khaled, of course, wasn't wasn't there and didn't get to have that moment with an audience in the room and to network and to have you know that to get that live sort of feedback. Um, but yeah, basically, we just we're still as as um, Sibyl mentioned, we're quite early in our distribution process. So we have identified the sort of festivals in different regions that we would still, we either have applied to or waiting to hear from. Um, so we do definitely think about the regions and the best festival in that region. So we obviously very, very pleased to have our African um, joint premiere with Encounters and Diff uh, for this film. And then uh, still looking for, you know, European and Middle East, North African premieres. Just a couple of things that I think are important to think about. Um, you know, we, we were very lucky with some of the funders that we had on this project. They were very um, 
generous with their time and advice and, and, and very open to giving us advice about um, festivals, festival strategy and festivals in their region. So, um, for example, the, the Doha Film Institute, uh, the, the grant manager there is incredibly generous and gives great advice about premieres, uh, about festivals in a sort of the Middle East and North Africa. So I think that's always great. And I'm sure, you know, the NFEF would do the same and different funders can give advice as well. And I think hopefully we all generate uh, good relationships with those funders. And I think that's a real resource to lean on um, if you have received some funding is to um, have a conversation, have a chat and get their buy-in, bring them into the, into the process. Um, and then one other thing that I thought of um, that I think every filmmaker underestimates, and I think ourselves included, is the cost of submitting to festivals. I mean, that is like its own line item. It's almost, it's not a full-time job, but it is a job. Like just one thing, you know, your press kit and your links and your, all those details, you know, you're spending a lot of time researching and submitting and paying. So, I mean, there's not many ways around that. Uh, if you're very lucky, the film gets pursued and, and programmers write to you and, and invite you to submit, or perhaps you've met a, a, a programmer at one of these local or international film events, if you're able to attend, and you've struck up a relationship that you can then follow up on months or even years later. So I think it is something to be aware of. I think one can always ask for a waiver. It's always worth it. Um, but it is definitely something to bear in mind and certainly something that we still grapple with. So, yeah, I think those were the things that I just wanted to touch on um, uh, on the festival front. Oh, I think Stephen, you, you'll probably speak about the balance between festival circuit um, and broadcast. I mean, I think that's, if you have made a sale to a broadcast, you do, you know, often festivals won't take a film once it's been online or been broadcast. So it is another thing to weigh up what kind of life you want your festival, um, your film to have out in the world. But yeah, there's just a few thoughts. Yeah, just on the festival front, uh, I'll try and be brief. Um, I mean, on the sales agent front, we spoke about festivals, I think, but on festivals for one second, I think it is important to recognize that it's been really difficult uh, uh, during COVID. I think that that this thing of having a premiere of your film and the team being together and kind of celebrating that moment is an incredibly cathartic moment and a, like a really important thing to have that, that live event. So I think it is important to recognize that I think filmmakers all over the world uh, have been through a really difficult time not having that that moment around your film of just kind of looking each other in the eye and recognizing what uh, what one's achieved and, and to get to that point. Uh, on the sales agent front, I think on that note with COVID, I think it's been really difficult. Um, I think our, our approach with sales agents is, you know, generally with a film is you want to kind of create a profile for a film uh, that people know about your film and they hear about it and it gets curated in some way before it's made. So you try and get into co-production markets and different pitching forums. And those are all forms of curation where, you know, some a, a committee has sat through 500 projects and chosen 10. And that stamp means something in terms of the profile of your film and can help you get attention with a lot of uh, sales agents and, and festivals for that matter. So I think that's a really important part is when you're starting out is to try and get into these markets. And, uh, and I think you learn from each one about what the market is looking for, what people think about your film, and you keep refining your ideas as you go. Uh, so I think that's a really important part of the, the process. But with sales agents on this film, we approached quite a few sales agents, uh, uh, um, uh, probably about five or six initially uh, in the development phase. And it was really difficult to get anyone on board. And um, we kept going. And 
then, you know, often with a film, we'll uh, use a festival as a way to get a sales agent to react to us because now we have some currency. We have some, uh, you know, we kind of, we're out in the public and someone else might snap us up. So often sales agents are, you know, I mean, on sales agents I speak to generally get about a thousand projects sent to them a year and they'll choose 10 or 15 of them. So that's another, uh, some are bigger, some will choose 40 or 50, but in general, the more boutique ones will, will choose under 20. Uh, and uh, so it's another form of curation and it's quite difficult to get the attention. So, so even though we've worked with quite a few sales agents over the years, it still is, uh, it's still difficult. And I think um, uh, one should be realistic about that. Um, so what we did with this film is eventually we got selected for hot docs and then uh, we started some conversations with sales agents and we're now busy negotiating, finalizing negotiation with a, a good sales agent. Uh, and, and so the film will, will uh, start getting more momentum behind it. Uh, and also our film is relatively time sensitive because you know this year is the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, the 10th anniversary of the death of Gaddafi. So it's a really uh, good point to try for broadcasters to try and spin something around. So the clock is ticking on us and we're feeling quite edgy about that because uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, next year, a lot of broadcasters will go, oh yeah, we did the Arab Spring last year. So I think one's got to be quite, uh, look at these anniversaries and these points where one can try and sell your film around. Uh, and just on the sales agent front, I think that, you know, what's already been mentioned earlier is one's got to really check sales agents out. It is generally, this business is quite, I would say, a dishonest business. It lacks transparency. I think there's a lot of bad stories out there of people being ripped off. We've certainly experienced that ourselves. So I think one's got to be very careful who one uh, uh, gets into bed with, uh, with sales agent-wise. And I think one's got to be careful how one negotiates. I think it's good to put uh, targets for the sales agent that they should meet to have a short contract with them, subject to their performance. And uh, I think the, the days of signing contracts with sales agents for five or seven years or longer are over. They have to deliver. They also have their own kind of instability. So you never know, they could get into financial trouble. Uh, they could uh, you know, sell to a bigger company. So one's really gotta be careful to not get uh, um, uh, tied into a sales agent for a long period of time. Uh, you know, my, my experience, I've always asked myself well, before you sign a contract is, is there any chance at a later point I'm gonna feel bitter about this? Like, will I come out of this feeling unhappy and start thinking of all the things that could make you unhappy and try and make sure you protect yourself in, in these deals? Um, but I think with sales agents, one has to try and, uh, you know, we kind of need them in the world because they are going to markets all the time. They're selling films to filmmakers, uh, to uh, broadcasters and platforms all the time. Uh, so one does need them, but they, one can do films without them. I mean, we, we did a film uh, years ago, which Khalid worked on as an editor called Beats of the Antonov. Uh, which uh, played in Toronto and won a big prize there. And all the sales agents rejected us. They like, no one wanted the film. And we ended up doing the sales ourselves and we ended up making money out of that. And there was no commissions, there were no reports. And uh, we managed to do that on our own using lawyers and advisors and things like that. So you can get your film out there without a sales agent. They're not the be all and end all, but they do have what you could call kind of frequent flyer miles. They have, you know, while we are making one documentary every two years, they're selling 10 a year. So they have much like deeper relationships with broadcasters and festivals, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that, you know, you can, you don't, don't be despaired if you don't get a sales agent. 
you can do it on your own. Now, I'm going to ask Khalid, he's going to talk about this uh, deeper topic. <laughs> well, I was going to say happy birthday to Mandisa, which is uh, you know, quite a deep topic. Happy birthday, Mandisa. <laughs> Um, I, no, I wanted to talk about uh, the fact that, you know, we make these films and we think about the distribution and it's kind of, uh, it's long term in the sense of, you know, maybe a three, four, five year strategy, right? But it's short term in the life of the film and what the, the films we make mean. Um, and I think, you know, for instance, Geordie's film, in a number of years, there won't be any Holocaust survivors alive. And so the film, um, you know, the documentary becomes um, a story of legacy and it becomes a story of, it becomes a document. And so the film and, and Aliki's film, Albinism and, and uh, prejudices around it are not going to go away anytime soon. So these films need to carry on and to complexify those, um, those discussions around what the films are talking about in the now. Um, my film also aims to complexify the, narrate, the, the, the narrative of Libya and the narrative of Gaddafi. Um, if you do a search on films about Libya, you'll see most of them are about Gaddafi. And they're about kind of, you know, the, the, the madness of Gaddafi or the craziness of him, the fetishization of him. So Libya has always been couched in this story of Gaddafi. Um, and so what my film does is, you know, and, and it's usually from the point of view of the West, um, and that kind of, uh, 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 yeah, that kind of point of view of that kind of interest on him. And that, that, that paints the narrative of what Libya is about and what it has been about over the last 50 years. And so my film tries to complexify that and tries to, to, to give a different point of view from Libyans um, who uh, lived under Gaddafi and who, were opposed, who opposed him. So I think it's important then when we talk about getting our films out there or the distribution of the film, it's also a long, long, longer term goal. And it's about legacy and it's about history, uh, story, you know, history making, especially making films from the continent. Um, we want to not just have a you know a, a, a small a minded view of africa and um that's why it's important it's important that we make films here on the continent about ourselves um but we need those other voices we need those other stories uh to to just enhance the narrative right because history is not just one-sided um yeah so that's what i wanted to say the deep thing i wanted to say well, thank you so much, Khalid. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, really, really beautiful, beautiful um, words of encouragement. Um, without wasting time, um, everyone, we actually are running out of time. Um, we do have a number of questions, actually, even from Facebook. Um, but what I would like to do now is to bring on board Aliki and Bridget and for their awesome, wonderful film, I Dot Mary, which is a very, very, very interesting um, film, which is about albism, also a little bit also about activism and um, predominantly family orientated. Um, their logline is, um, I Mary takes on an in-depth and highly intimate look at the experiences of albism through the eyes of Mary, Mary Regina Lovu, an activist who has made it her personal mission to make albism more visible in society and the media. I think this is a really, really important story in South Africa, um, throughout the world, in fact. And I think, you know, it's brilliant that we have the beautiful ladies um, as part of our panelists to discuss um, ways of how they actually distributed the film and how they got the film out there without um, making people not 
not one to listen because I know there's a lot of stories about albism, a lot of different types of stories, but I think this one is very heartfelt. Um, and take it away, ladies. Definitely love to hear from you. Um, we'll take questions way after um, Aliki and Bridget have finished and so that we can um, continue with the conversations to the end. Hopefully we still have time. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Bridget Pickering and um, I'm the producer for I Marry. Um, I think what I'll have is Aliki just to maybe introduce a little bit about the film, how she met and got involved with Regina Mary, who's our key character and the protagonist of the film. And then I can step back and talk a little bit about how this film really came about because the origin of how we made the film is very much linked to a kind of distribution strategy. And Leaky will then talk about its impact campaign. Um, this film is very much driven by a strategy around impact. And then I'll talk a little bit more about kind of the positioning of the film um, locally, globally, continentally, um, in terms of festivals and sales agent. So Aliki, I don't know, maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, your connection and why you made this film. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. It's very, very cool to be here. Thank you, Encounters. Thank you, DFA. <coughs> Um, and the panel. It's been really, really interesting and amazing to hear everyone speak through their journeys. Um, so for so for us and for me, this journey was was different to my previous film um, in in quite substantial ways that I think Bridget will also speak back to in in terms of the origins. But for me, um, I'm. I usually like to make films on gender um, and women's stories. Um, it's just something I've kind of, I think, fell into. <laughs> but I really did want to make a film on gender-based violence, um, especially looking at, you know, the um, current situation in South Africa and femicide. It was always something I really wanted to do, but I hadn't had the opportunity to do it. And um, I had met, Regina Mary actually on an, on an, for another film that, that didn't end up working out um, due to COVID and, and a whole bunch of things. But I'd met her before and her story really sat on my heart um, because I felt like it was such an intersectional lens into uh, gender-based violence um, due to her story, but also, also albinism and um, and the trauma that she had to go through, but it was so much more than that. It was it was about identity, and for me, it's about the surviving of every day and the masks that you know survivors wear every day, um, and kind of this line, this liminal line of death and life. So that that's kind of um, really what I was when 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 we got the opportunity to do this documentary that Bridget will go into further. It was. Um, we were actually commissioned to do a two-part documentary um, a series for Faces of Africa, which is a CGTA in the China Global Television Network strand. Um, and it was on, and we, we were, uh, you know, trying to find a story on GBV. And then that's where I thought, oh, Regina Mary, um, let's, let's finally be able to tell her story. So that's, um, that's kind of how it started. And then, um, and then, we had the opportunity that Bridget will talk, talk further to after the broadcast kind of, you know, which is also very, um, it's very methodical the way that, you know, you, you make a film for broadcast, a two part series. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to get funding to make it into a feature length film, which for me was vital also for distribution and for audiences because um, you know, I felt that, that a feature version of the film just allowed it allowed personally as a director more space to explore the themes, um, explore these layers, breathing um, through the, you know, identity and, and all these, these complexities. But also provided Regina Mary a larger audience that she could use as, a, to, for, so for the film to be used as a tool within her impact, which is really the major part of, like the major really reason for the film living the way that it lives and being the way that it is. 
um, is really to add to Regina Mary's already incredibly active activism online. Um, she started a, um, a, a talk show called My Voice Albinism, The New Era to re reinsert and uh, change representations of people with albinism. And it's reached cross-continental, but it's all bootleg, like, you know, um, uh, citizen journalism, like from her own pocket. So, so um, that's really the crux of the story and her, and obviously this, this, this history of, 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 of violence that she's experienced and this liminal existence and identities. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of, that's where, um, you know, the story came out. It's a very sensitive story. It's very intimate. I had to form a, a like a very close uh, trust, trust, trusting friendship with her to be able to tell the story in an authentic and a responsible way. Um, so that's, that was a huge part of the filming process. And yeah, but in essence, the film was made quite quickly, like considering other films that we've both been part of, you know, that have taken years, this film was really completed within a year. Um, also with COVID as a theme. So yeah, I think I'll, I think that's it for now. Maybe Bridget can carry on and then I'll, I'll jump in with the impact part again. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Aliki. Um, so I think what Stephen was saying about the more you know, um, or the more you do it, the less you know. Um, and I kind of feel that having worked in the industry for kind of over 25 years, but I also think that really speaks to um, this gap that exists between kind of your intent. So when you make a film, you are so invested in it and you believe in it and you believe in the characters. Um, and you think everyone else is going to believe in it like you and be invested in it like you, and you don't know. So when you release it into the world, you are really, um, what is it, on a wing and a prayer um, that you hope that the world out there will find your film and love your film. And, and of course, that sometimes happens but it happens in ways you could never imagine. Or <laughs> so for me, um, yes, there's there's a plan, there's an idea, but also I think there's a kind of trust um, in the intent of the film, and that's why I think it's so important to absolutely have trust and belief in your film to have an intent because you will get rejected, you will get people saying, oh, you know, we don't like this or that or whatever. So you have to really be the force of that continues to, to push the, the film out there. Um, and one of the things for me, uh, this was the first documentary I'd made out of almost a 10 year hiatus. I'd started my career making documentaries in the early nineties and kind of very much political, social political films um, and really stepped back for many reasons, but also just kind of you know, um, kind of get got a little bit overwhelmed with this idea of trauma and how do you deal with trauma in 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 our countries, in our continent. Um, so this film was very much a kind of it kind of happened by a kind of um, confluence and synergy, working with Aliki on the project that never got made, um, but also I think. Um, having sort of heard Regina Mary's story and understood that this is someone who comes from very much a traumatized space, but is also incredibly powerful and empowering, just a character who's just extraordinary, you know? Um, and for those who haven't seen the film, um, that journey or the journey that she takes, I think is really uh, one that is ultimately, um, I think a journey of triumph. So that kind of helps, you know, that helps that you kind of really believe in the higher purpose of a, of a project or of a story. Um, the, the creation and origin of this film was much more mundane um, in the sense that it was a, a kind of commissioned piece that um, uh, a company that I used to be part of uh, had a, a documentary slate and they were looking for a project and uh, this project um, felt right to them. But already I think on the second day, it started off as a 24 minute half hour film. On the second day, um, 
already as we were driving to film again, we kind of said uh, to each other, this is like a bigger film. This is a two part series. So I sent a WhatsApp message immediately. Do you want a two part series instead of a half hour film? Um, because we just felt the material was incredibly, you know, I mean, you're telling the story of someone from the age of kind of eight, nine to kind of, uh, what is it, 30 years old. Um, and it's kind of a story that kind of needs to be kind of um, nurtured. You know, you can't rush a story like this. You don't want to kind of simplify it because it's so complex and deep and um, multi-layered. Um, so that kind of, that happened on day two. And then by day kind of five, or as you know, we, in, in the process of making the film, we also just realized that we wanted to tell a story that kind of was more expansive and explorative and not so kind of tightly defined by sort of broadcast. And so we kind of pitched that um, to the production company and the reality is that the footage we shot, the material we shot was owned by CGTN, which is China um, Global Television. And um, so that we kind of thought, okay, well, let's just leave it and see what happens. When the when we when once they're happy with the two part series, we can see if they would be willing for us to take this material and convert it into some, something kind of more cinematic. Um, they really loved the two part. It did really really well. Um, it's kind of really I think in a way broke the molds for a lot of the stories and there were a lot of the kind of episodes they'd already done before. Um, and so um, the question, of course, was that if we needed to recut it, we kind of needed time and money. And simultaneously, I had been talking to a funder about the project that got dropped. So um, when we got to this recut, I went back to them and I said, oh, you know, you know, the film we were going to make, sorry, we can't make it, but do you mind if we make this other film, which kind of explores similar issues and themes, and um, it's also an incredible character. The great thing is we had the material, so they could see for themselves that this was a truly kind of incredible um, story and woman, and so they said yes, and we recut the film. Um, so right away, I think for us, it was always going to be a film that was really about changing lives, about informing, about educating. Um, I mean, albinism is clearly, it's a global issue. People have albinism all over the world. Uh, I think the reason why it's so sort of, you know, I guess identified with an African kind of space is because most Africans are dark skinned. And so when you see these kind of, um, so this kind of, uh, 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 I guess the kind of, uh, you know, people's albinism in families, communities, um, it just, you know, it's, it stands out. It's, a, it's very clearly, um, you know, something that is, uh, that you see the difference. So I think um, it, it, it definitely, and, and Regina Mary, as Aliki says, has, is, is, is clearly an activist. She's someone who's already been out there pushing. Uh, she was already out there kind of um, make, you know, making videos, creating this uh, talk show that she put online. Um, but for us, definitely, um, and speaking not just to South Africa, but to the continent, um, the discrimination, the kind of the violence that exists around people with albinism is all over the continent. So for us, it was absolutely critical that we, um, we found a way to, um, to make the story available. So CGTN, and, and for many different reasons, um, felt like the right partner. Um, we are also very much so we've got I Mary as this future documentary cut and clearly the um, the intention was always like how do we position this film um, CGN will screen the feature cut at some point, but they eventually said yes absolutely we're happy go off and kind of uh, make the the film that you feel can be a stronger film that could travel globally. And so for us, it, uh, Eliki will talk more about the impact campaign, but I think this idea of, um, you know, I, th I think Stephen said this about positioning the film, what, what options do you have? And festivals are it, you know, festivals are a way of really making people aware of it, whether it's audiences, whether it's sales agents, whether it's community. Um, so for us, definitely, we knew that 
um, we wanted to get the film out there through um, kind of festivals. So that was in a way, one of the strategies that we felt could be, um, that had to be utilized um, because we did want this film not to just travel because of that, the issue is global, but also because I think Regina Mary sees her, you know, she gets contacted by people from all over the world, from India, from Brazil, people all who have albinism. So she is someone, so this is a topic and an issue that is relevant um, to, to, to a global audience. So I think for us, it was look at looking at the human rights festivals, we kind of knew that it was a niche film. It's very much a niche film with the possibility of speaking to, um, to a bigger audience. And uh, I mean, it's interesting that as we've shown the film in the, in the, in the sort of uh, so far in the two or three screenings we've had, you know, how many people come to you and say, oh yes, you know, I've got someone in my family who has albinism and you know, this is how, you know, and people are almost kind of not embarrassed, but there's a kind of kind of fear about talking about, um, uh, about this. Um, so for us, definitely the idea that this could travel is all, has always been part of it. So we're very much at the beginning of the strategy and of the plan. Um, we've submitted it to, human rights festivals, uh, we've already kind of got into two. And so that is really something we will pursue in terms of just looking for very specific festivals that we speak to um, human rights, because I think the film does kind of cross sect, you know, so uh, sexual violence, human rights. Um, I mean, in, in, it speaks to kind of a number of different issues. Um, and I think ideally we are looking to see also how how the film will travel um, through the continent. Um, so the funder who supported the production um, has offices uh, all over the continent and we are looking to see how we can um, chat to them about, um, about how we see this film. I mean, Regina Mary is such a critical part of the story. So at every screening so far, she's been there because in a way, her talking about this experience, her talking about the journey, her talking about her kind of transcendence is like, there's, you know, there's nothing better, you know, um, she is the person that is really, you know, the, the, the person that uh, will take the story forward, um, because uh, it's her story. And it's something that she wants to use to really, in a way, change the world for herself. And all we're doing is really empowering that and supporting that kind of um, journey. Um, in terms of sales agents, um, again, this is a very difficult space because it's again, who? Who is interested in a story like this for, you know, um, if in the hierarchy of stories where, you know, you know, who are, what, uh, what is important? Um, this is clearly a story that, you know, when you send it to like the big sales agents or whoever, you know, um, it's always a kind of question of, you know, who's interested in this, you know, um, this is a story of a, of a young black girl in, in Africa. So you're fighting against all these kind of uh, notions. And so um, I think uh, we definitely, but I think once people see the film, they really are just kind of captivated. I think uh, she, she is, you know, this character that people fall in love with. So, um, that has kind of, um, you know, when people see the film, the first thing they always say is that we love her. We think she's amazing. So I think that we are hoping that that becomes the kind of the, the hook that everyone um, uh, uh, sort of gets in, um, makes people want to get involved in the film. Um, so we've sent it to a few sales agents and people are looking at it. We've had a sales agent in Holland looking at the film. Um, and we've sent it obviously to the traditional um, sales agents like Women Make Movies um, and uh, people like that who deal with these sort of issues. So no one confirmed yet, but we are hoping that, uh, especially after these two screenings at Encounters at Diff, that uh, that kind of journey will kind of, um, you know, in a way go, it will allow us to kind of maybe approach new people, people will approach us. So yeah. Aliki. Yeah, 
Cool, I'll be very brief, um, but I just wanted to, because that's a big part of the film, I did just want to mention the impact campaign as part of the distribution. Um, so like we said, the, 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 the film is really was intended to be used as a tool within Regina Mary's arsenal. It's really her story. She's the one who's leading the impact. So the impact campaign kind of thinking was very much around a collaboration between the film team and Regina Mary to amplify what she's already doing. Um, so uh, there's kind of, because the film has very two distinct themes, uh, the impact is, is around those themes. So the one is the myths and un unpacking the myths around albinism. Um, but and then also breaking silences around gender based violence um, and you'll you'll see in the film there is a there's a conversation with her and her mother which really shows this kind of the silences around GBV. And so that's obviously a really big part of the film so two impact goals we have are changing minds so that's around creating awareness around these dangerous myths that keep people with albinism in danger, especially in more rural areas. And then we the second one is building communities. So that's around increasing the capacity of my voice albinism, the new era, um, which is a reality. You know, a lot of um, activists and people who are doing this work are do it completely on their own. They have no capacity in which to do it in. And, and, and we feel that part of the impact campaign needs to be trying to build capacity around Regina Mary so she can continue doing the work that she's doing. So I guess changing minds is, is very much a community based screening tour focused within communities who do not have access to cinema so using partners partners is a huge thing around impact campaigns so using partners. We can have pop up screenings um, local NPOs local organizations and local leadership. Um, even trying to engage with uh, traditional healers, um, you know, uh, uh, and really allowing for a safe and open dialogue space. Um, in, in like a grassroots level. Then we also looking at a top down approach, approach police departments uh, in terms of how victims of sexual abuse are handled. Um, or, and then also in terms of um, focusing on major media houses and representation of people with albinism, because that is something that Regina Mary speaks a lot to is the fact that, and what she is trying to change is this representation of like, I am more than my albinism kind of thing. Um, and then, like I mentioned, it's building community. So it's really trying to allow what Regina Mary wants, which is to 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 get this film and her and her show cross continent. So that means, uh, you know, really getting the DVDs out there that she that she, like low cost out there to to people cross continent. Really like focusing on sunscreen fundraising um, and and uh, yeah. Um, building capacity for her to be able to do this full time. Um, so that's kind of the, the that's the, the impact strategy in a nutshell. We're also very early stages and oh, it's a whole, impact is a whole other beast compared to just like traditional distribution. There are intersections, for example, if SABC, does, uh, you know, if we could get it onto SABC, that's a traditional distribution broadcast, but it also allows for, a, for you know, national audiences. Um, and so, Impact also needs a whole lot of funding. So that's another like, you know, stage where we're at is like, how do we now build the fund, like get funding for the impact after you've, you know, you've made the film, which is already in itself a very uh, exhausting and amazing process. Then now you need to do the same for the impact. So that's kind of where we're at on that one. Very quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aliki and Bridget. That was incredible. Um, really, really beautiful story. And also, I think I can congratulate you both. Um, it is quite a very tough topic to share, um, but I think you both did a really excellent job and um, beautiful, beautiful, well-articulated words. Um, I just want to say to everyone, we are sitting on 12.25 right now. Um, we've exceeded our time. This is quite a hot topic and um, it's very difficult to cut down what everyone has to share because it's quite important um, sort of information to share with everyone or the filmmakers who are trying to break into the industry. So um, I don't know if we've got quite a lot of questions going um, for everyone, actually, all the panelists. Um, I don't know how we should do this. Maybe you guys can come up with suggestions, but there is another 
um, panel discussion at two. So I think we might have to break off and allow time for the next panelists to actually um, log in and test things. Um, so I guess we probably would have to leave the conversations here and perhaps answer the questions um, online. But we do have five more minutes. Don't know if we can kill all those questions in five minutes. So should we give it a go? I think we should. Um, I'll kick off with the very last question, which was actually directed to Aliki and Bridget. Um, it's, it's, it's from Munzikelelo Mavata. And he says, how can interviewees be compensated without corrupting the authenticity of the information we get from them? Um, he says also, it always feels like we are taking from them and not leaving much behind. Mm. Leaky, do you want to? Okay, sure. Um, it is it is one of the biggest questions in in documentaries that I think uh, everyone has um, kind of been through, and I think it has changed over the years. Um, it's it's we're constantly doing research to see what is where like where the documentary filmmakers are positioned around this because you I mean we all know when you when you have it when you are a documentary filmmaker you hold a lot of power. Um, and so it's it's that it's that give and take. So yes, you are you are getting their stories and putting it out there, and they are giving you so much as well. So for us, it it isn't it's it's kind of known that if you pay someone for their um, for their story or for like as an interview, it's not ethical because it's it's a matter of then um, you know. Uh, would they have given you that story if if you they weren't paid? Is, is it has it been corrupted in that way? So as you say, there's that balance. But then also it's the idea that you are you are often um, in spaces where people uh, you know are struggling, where like survival is the most um, you know is just what they need, and 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 that's kind of where they're living. So you have to be very aware of that. So I guess the ways that we find around it is to is to support in other ways. So we. Um, you know, when it comes to location fees, um, you know, in, it's in someone's home or it comes to going to, you know, uh, um, supporting them with, with groceries or, or finding ways to support them further than, than, than just that day of the film. If they have, um, you know, fundraising, crowdsourcing, uh, impact fundraising, like all of that to support the various projects that they have. Like that's how I guess we try to find a way to compensate because it is a very, it's a, it's, it's, it's legitimate. Um, and, you know, inside, especially in South Africa, you know, um, it's very important to be thinking about these things. So that's at least how we try, that's how we try to do it. Obviously everyone will be different and everyone has different ways, but yeah, that's yeah. how we try. I think uh, you also have to be quite specific. And I think with Regina Mary, we absolutely had the conversation with her at the beginning in terms of also what she felt this was about and what, what she would get out of it in a way beyond just making a film. And it is, I think, also about positioning herself that she wanted to have her story be told on the biggest platform that was possible. Um, and so that was for her important, having the material, uh, being able to use the material for her purposes, um, because she is a, um, she's also a kind of a, a media personality. Um, and also, um, yeah, and being a partner on the project, you know, being a, a kind of producing partner. Um, she is a producing partner. So that is something that absolutely is always fr uh, front and center. So I think it really, you have to sit down with your, with your character or characters and really engage in that discussion up front and talk about it and see how best you can make that work for you and for them. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Aliki. Really, really um, informative, really brilliant on the impact strategy. Actually, for DocShare, we will have one of those sessions um, where we actually talk about impact strategy distribution. I'm going to sum up um, three questions in one. Um, this, this does go out for mostly Stephen Tamsin. 
um, and also, um, yeah, Bri uh, Gabriella. So what I'm gonna do is that either one can answer, um, especially, especially the 25 years of experience, people. Um, <laughs> so we basically gonna go for um, Hossi. Hossi was a Facebook questionnaire who asked, um, she or he was curious about what good distribution deal might look like. And what do you think is the best way to negotiate as a young um, fledging producer? I'm gonna team that question up because it's the same as uh, a question that Uveli Samwane had asked Stephen is how early is it to connect with people, i.e. producers to distribute in order to garner some kind of momentum to build a strategy for one films? So those two questions I think um, are similar. Um, and then Michael Klein also asked um, Tamsin regarding film festival, is it feasible to get films into A-list festivals like Hot Dogs by just applying through the submission platform or realistically are films chances um, helped by having a producer with a relationship history with those festivals? Um, yeah, I think those questions go together. So anyone can shoot, maybe let's start off with Stephen. Well, Tamsin, maybe you go first on the festival question. Sure. I mean, yeah, we've applied to lots of festivals just cold through a submission platform, lots, uh, for lots of different projects. So it is totally feasible. Of course, they, I mean, there's no advantage. There's never any guarantees. Um, you could know a programmer personally, and that's not, not necessarily going to mean anything. So I think, yes, it's totally feasible. If you have met somebody from the programming team, if you've been funded by, you know, some film festivals have um, sort of sister funds or, or uh, affiliated funds, and maybe you've been supported by that festival, you might, your name might ring a bell, you know, but th there's no guarantees in this world. So absolutely do apply cold through those platforms. We do all do it. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think there's a much higher percentage of selection of films that festival programmers have been tracking or have got them on a list or they've met someone at another festival or if, uh, in a market, et cetera. So it does increase your chance of being noticed, but not necessarily being selected because at the end of the day, it's not nepotism. Uh, they will select films that they want to select not because you know they had a drink with a producer uh, so i think th that's it does increase your chance of being noticed but not selected uh the uh, other questions i'll be brief because i know we're over time I'd, and i'll see if i can remember most of them but um i think the the how early does one start bringing attention to your problem is a difficult question because you want to create momentum around your project but also if you pitch too loudly or too publicly very early, you can also get a, you know, you just bump into the commissioning editor three years later and they don't really understand or care of all your problems you've had. They just go like, oh, you're still making that film. It must be a bit of a problem kind of thing. So I think you do, but people who like care less, they do judge you if it takes very long. Whereas often documentary filmmakers wear it as a badge of honor. Yeah, it took me so long to make it, blah, blah, blah. I've suffered so much. The average sales agent broadcaster doesn't really care. They just think, well, if it's taken so long, obviously a lot of people have rejected you. And so there must be something like problematic with this film. So, I think one should be careful not to make too much of a noise too early about your film. Uh, and uh, because I think you can, unless you know you're able to make it in quite a relatively short space of time. And by that, I would say that would be like one to two or three years. Uh, um, and I've certainly made that mistake of making a big noise very early. And then people ask me 10 years later, uh, how's that film going? You know? so, 
So it's, it's definitely uh, something to to watch out for. Um, so yeah, I think uh, be careful of that. Uh, were there other questions that we haven't covered? Um, no, Stephen, you have covered all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, I don't know if Gabriella wanted to add something to that. Yes. Actually, I was going to say, yes, Gabriella, if you'd like to add something to that, please also include the fact that um, how this was a question from Pablo. How was your approach to getting into um, encounters and also DFM, um, also with emails that you had to respond? Um, and how did you conduct the 10 to 15 emails, um, considering the distributors, funders and festivals? Sure, I think um, I'll answer that question first. We, when, um, yeah, exactly, you know, Jordi mentioned that Tamsin had given us advice to attend the Durban um, Film Art, and we went on the list of delegates, and I suppose we broke it down into who are, you know, directors or producers, you know, fellow filmmakers that we wanted to ask their advice on on their journey. Um, then we looked at who are um, sales agents, and we also looked at who were were film um, who are film festival programmers or um, who are representative of film festivals. I think that echoes what Tamsin and Stephen have also been speaking about. Is it is good to you know send an introductory email to a programmer? Obviously, during COVID, you, there's there were much less networking events that could have happened organically where you can get to know people. So we, you know, if we hadn't met them in person, then we did send out um, an email. I think one of the best pieces of advice we got is to, if, you know, if you've submitted to hundreds of film festivals um, or, you know, a, I suppose not so many, but if you submit to film festivals, um, and then you get into another one, it's actually good to send an email and update those other film festivals to say, we've gotten into this and kind of create a bit of FOMO between the festivals. And, a, and um, But at the end of the day, as Tamsin and Stephen says, the film has to speak for itself. It doesn't matter how connected you are. Um, you have to have a, you have to have a strong film. Um, but I think, yeah, with just with regards to those meetings, um, that we had at DFM or the, the emails that we had, um, we were quite clear with our intention in terms of, can you give us advice on this process? It's our first time doing it. Um, can we set up a, you know, a virtual a Zoom call? Um, yeah, I think, I hope that answers the question. Spot on, Gabriella. Thank you so much. Um, just to close the session off, of the 23rd Encounters Film Festival, the discussion panel of DFA and Dakshe. Um, this was our first launch actually. So this was our very first session and you guys really all rocked to the beautiful panelists and the handsome panelists as well. We really just want to say we really appreciate this uh, moment, the time you took out to share with us your awesome, amazing stories. Thank you for your time. Really much appreciated. And we do hope to connect again and looking forward to the next sessions that we can discuss and share with budding filmmakers. Your, you guys are all splendid. Thank you and enjoy, enjoy Friday afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Sibu. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.